Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. As you can tell, it's morning for me because I'm still in my comfy pajamas, but I welcome you to Amazing Creations, where I talk about God's amazing grace and how he is creating me to be a new creation in Christ Jesus every single day and those that he brings me around. Um, I just, uh, my name is Christina Cerezo. I just wanted to share uh, what the Lord placed on my heart in my alone time with him this morning. I really felt um, excited that I received a new revelation of this passage in the Bible that I'm going to read in the book of John. So if you want to just grab your Bible, um, it's going to be chapter two of John. And it talks about basically the first sign, the first miracle Jesus performed, turning water into wine. So I am reading from the CSB version, and I will start. On the third day, a wedding took place in Cana of Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding as well. When the wine ran out, Jesus' mother told him, they don't have any wine. What does that have to do with you and me, woman? Jesus asked. My hour has not yet come. Do whatever he tells you, his mother told the servants. Now, six stone water jars had been set there for Jewish purification. Each contained 20 or 30 gallons. Fill the jars with water, Jesus told them. So they filled them to the brim. Then he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the head waiter. And they did, verse nine. When the head waiter tasted the water after it had become wine, he did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. He called the groom, verse 10, and told him, everyone sets out the fine wine first. Then after people are drunk, the inferior, but you have kept the fine wine until now. Verse 11, Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee. He revealed his glory and his disciples believed him. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord, for your word that is alive, active, and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing between joint and marrow, spirit and soul, and a discerner of the hearts and our thoughts. Father, we just give this time to you, Lord. I pray for everyone under the sound of my voice, everyone who is going to hear this message, Lord. I pray that you would personalize it for them, for their lives. Speak to their hearts, Lord God. Pinpoint things in their heart as you desire, that would transform them, renew their minds so that they would be holy and blameless before you and pleasing unto you, God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. We praise you and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. So as I was reading this this morning, I felt like the Lord drew me to uh, this particular passage um, because he wanted to... um, basically show me a contrast between the first covenant, the old covenant, and the new covenant. So I'm just going to read off of my notes and um, elaborate as the the Holy Spirit leads. So the first, the first uh, verse that he drew my attention to was actually verse six, uh, where it says, now six stone water jars. So, um, He basically told me that he has, I was reading, this is how I came to the passage. I was reading out of the book, um, Jesus Calling, and it's a devotional book. And actually, maybe I should read that as well. So Jesus Calling for December 31st says, and this is, imagine Jesus saying these words to you so that the Holy Spirit can personalize it for you and where you are in in this season. So December 31st, as this year draws to a close, receive my peace. This is still your deepest need. And I, your Prince of Peace, long to pour myself into your neediness. My abundance and your emptiness are a perfect match. 
I designed you to have no sufficiency of your own. I created you as a jar of clay set apart for sacred use. I want you to be filled with my very being, permeated through and through with peace. Thank me for my peaceful presence, regardless of your feelings. Whisper my name in loving tenderness. My peace, which lives continually in your spirit, will gradually work its way through your entire being. And the recommended verses are Isaiah 9, uh, verse 6, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7, and John chapter 14, verses 26 and 27. So as you can see, the Lord personally um, drew me, excuse me, drew me to this passage of uh, the first sign um, the first miracle he performed in his ministry, uh, because he wanted to contrast what that was saying. When he highlighted the part of, I made, I created you into a jar of clay and you were designed for sacred use right there. He began and he said, um, basically he drew me to verse six, excuse me. Um, so in verse six, actually, let me keep this here so that I can go back and forth. I want to go verse by verse with you. If you allow me, if you stick it out, um, in verse six, it says now six stone water jars had been set there for Jewish purification. Each contained 20 or 30 gallons. Um, number six in the Bible is the number of man. Right, and we know 666 is of the beast, but number six personally is the number of man. Um, in the New Testament, it talks about how we are living stones unto God, how uh, Jesus is the cornerstone, right, and how we are being built on that chief cornerstone um, into a living temple for God, for the Holy Spirit, because that's what He has desired from day one to dwell with man and for man to dwell with Him. Um, so we are jars of clay and we are meant for purification. And if you read this verse and the next one, you can see that these jars were set aside and they actually were empty. So the first thing that comes to my mind that I didn't even write in my notes is Luke chapter nine, verse 23, where the Lord says, if anyone wishes to follow me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily and come after me, right? So we, what does that mean? Deny yourself, take up your cross. It means your desires, your will, your fleshly wants and needs have to be crucified. They have to be put on the cross, nailed to the cross because you claim Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. So if you if we are claiming Jesus as our Lord and Savior, Galatians 2.20 2, 20 is one of my v favorite verses where it says, I no longer live this, Christ, this life, but Christ who lives in me. For this life I live now in the flesh is by the faith of the Son of God who, who loved me and gave himself for me. Jesus purchased us with his holy blood and he paid a tremendous price. He suffered a gruesome death that no one would ever be able to handle, endure, or suffer. Not only that, but he took upon himself our sins on that cross, past, present, and future, in order that when we receive him and are baptized and 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 water baptized into the kingdom of God, into his Holy Spirit, when he adopts us through his Holy Spirit then we are now by faith living this life and through him and he through us, right? Without the Holy Spirit, I wouldn't be able to have received this revelation. I wouldn't be able to share this teaching with you um, and him be able to personalize it to you, tailored to your life and speak to your heart about certain situations that you are now facing, that you faced also in the year of 2020, which obviously he wants you to prosper and grow in the year 2021. He doesn't want us circling the same mountain. He doesn't want us 
um, continuing to be in the valley. When the children of, of, of the Israelites of old went into the wilderness, they were drawn into the wilderness by, by God. And just like Jesus was drawn into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit in fasting for 40 days and uh, being tempted of Satan. So it's the same with us. When God wants to prosper us and take us to new levels and to new mountaintops, and he wants us to experience his glory and his power, he doesn't want us just living this mediocre Christian life. He will bring the trials. He'll bring the wilderness. And it's up to us to not complain and murmur as the Israelites of old did, but to give thanks to God in all circumstances for this is his will for us in Christ Jesus. Excuse me. There's like this little fly um, flying around, but that's 1 Thessalonians 5.18. We are to thank him in all circumstances. You don't need to thank him for the sickness. You don't need to thank him for poverty or the struggle, but thank him that he is with us. Us in the midst of that, he is on his throne, he's sovereign, and he's in control. Glory be to God. Um, so you know, the jars were empty, and Jesus gave the command in verse seven, right? Remember, I said uh, six is the number of man. In verse seven, seven is the number of perfection and completeness. Okay, so Jesus gives the command in verse seven: fill the jars with water, Jesus told them. So they filled them to the brim, right? And what I want to uh, uh, highlight here is that Jesus gives a command and then they obey. Jesus says in, I believe, the book of John, if you love me, you will obey me. So you can claim Jesus Christ, you can claim you're a Christian all you want, but if you're not obeying his commands as the Holy Spirit brings them to you, because it's not about the law, it's not about the law, it's not about obeying the law, because that's the first covenant, right? It's about grace, but grace doesn't mean you have a license to sin. Paul talks about that um, in Galatians as well, to not take uh, uh, grace for granted and think that you could live however it is that you want to live because Jesus, again, purchased us with a price and it was very costly to him. He gave up everything. He left all his riches, all his splendor, all his glory in heaven to come down, to become a baby and to eventually bring his ministry about, teach everybody about repentance and the kingdom of God and how the kingdom of God is, and then to be crucified and slaughtered and murdered for you and me. Okay, so hallelujah, Jesus gave a command and then they obeyed, right? So obedience and response to God's commands are key for it to go well for us in our lives. And I've learned that through trial and error because there was once upon a time where I was living in willful disobedience, where I was shutting uh, down the Holy Spirit's voice and he would nudge me gently because he's a gentleman. So he's going to correct us in love, right? There's a proverb that says, do not despise the correction of your father for he only, God only corrects those he loves, right? And, and another proverb says, only fools despise correction, right? So God corrects us. He's constantly correcting us. And when we read his word, he will bring conviction. And it's, it says in Timothy that the word of God is for reproof and for correction and for teaching, right? So in, and in uh, I think it's James, it says, don't just be a hearer of the word, but be a doer of God's word. You know, uh, faith by faith without works is dead. So you could talk about all the faith you want that you have in God, but if He's sending you to do something and continually, if He gives you an um um a command and you don't obey, do you think He's gonna continue to 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 speak to you and give you other commands and and it's like. It's like a manual. He's giving you instructions and he's a God of order. So he's going to give you the first thing to do. And if you skip over that, then you're going to be stuck on that one command that he gave you last. And it's our job to seek him in spirit and in truth and say, God, did I miss something? Did you tell me to do something that I didn't do? Forgive me, cleanse me with your holy blood and help me. Give me the willingness to obey. This flesh, it doesn't want to die. It doesn't want to read the word of God. It doesn't want to pray. It doesn't want to do the things of the Lord, right? Because the carnal mind can never please God. But when we begin to humble ourselves, God resists the proud and exalts 
exalts the humble. So when, you, when we begin to humble ourselves, the Holy Spirit comes and he begins to do a work and places the desire in our heart to pray according to his will, plan, and purpose. And even when we can't pray, because there's sometimes that I've gone through that, okay, he still leads and guides us um, and makes intercession for us and groanings which cannot be uttered. That's they talk, uh, uh, Paul talked about that in Romans. So um, the jars are filled to the brim with water, right? And God was talking to me about full submersion um, through Colossians earlier. And I'm just going to read it real quick. Colossians 2 verses 11 through 15. When you came to Christ, you were quote unquote circumcised, but not by a physical procedure in the natural. Christ performed a spiritual circumcision, the cutting away of your sinful nature. For you were bur buried with Christ when you were baptized and with him, you were raised to new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. You were dead because of your sins and because of your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ for he forgave all our sins. He canceled the record of charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory on them over the cross over them, excuse me, on the cross. So um, the fact that the, the servants obeyed Jesus and filled up these empty jars, which spiritually represents us, right? So when we empty our lives and our will and our desires, God then comes by his Holy Spirit because water represents the Holy Spirit in the, in, in the Bible. So he comes by his Holy Spirit. We're submerged in water. We also go through a physical baptism, which announces to the world, um, you know, it's a symbolism of our death of our old life. And when we come out of the water, we have new life in Christ, right? Second Corinthians five seventeen. That's what this channel is based on new life in Christ. Behold, all things have passed away. The flesh has been crucified with Christ, right? So the Holy Spirit as water is a symbolism of cleansing and purification. And in the beginning of, the, of these verses, it was it, it uh, mentioned how the stone water jars were set aside for purification, right? So, man, this is just such a beautiful revelation that the Lord gave me today. Glory be to God, because he's just awesome the way he uh, teaches us his word and the, the levels and the depths of his word. I've come to a point in my Christian walk. I've, I'm like five plus years walking with the Lord now, um, that just writing the verses is no longer working for me. God is taking me into a deeper place where I now have to actually study his word in order to glean from it, in order to, um, you know, be filled with the fruit of his word and be uh, renewed in my mind and transformed by the renewing of my mind through his word, uh, cleansing my thoughts and purifying my thoughts. So then in verse eight, right? Eight in the Bible means new beginnings. Then he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the head waiter and then it says, and they did. Again, it comes back to Jesus's command, right? And then obedience. When he gives us a command, we obey. If we find ourselves in disobedience or not wanting to obey, then we need to pray for God's grace to help us to obey. We need to pray that God will give us willingness, that we would be submitted and surrendered to his will, to his Holy Spirit, and then he will act. Um, it's a, a, a co-labor. He's It's partnership with him and us. Hallelujah. So um, for, for this verse, verse eight, he gave me Hebrews 11, verse six. And it says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he that comes to God must first believe that he's, he exists, number one. And number two, that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So that's not me seeking him today and not seeking him till next week. That's not me seeking him 
right now and not speaking to him for the rest of the day. No, that's diligently seeking him. I constantly invite God into my life, into my circumstances, into my situations. I'm constantly asking him for his wisdom and discernment. What is his plan for each situation and what he feels I should do um, when things come up? And he leads me by his spirit. He leads me and he guides me. And I don't always get it right. I make mistakes, but praise be to God that he's sovereign and that he knows how to redirect me back on this straight and narrow. See, it's just almost like a, a global a pointing system. It's a God pointing system, a GPS, right? We ask him, he leads us. We might make mistakes along the way, but just like a GPS reroutes us and gets us back on course to the destination, so does the Holy Spirit. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. So he brought me to that verse, right? And so here's another command of Jesus in this verse, which again requires not only obedience this time, but it, it requires faith and boldness. Since Jesus was sending the servants who only filled the jars with water to an authority, right? He expected them to have faith to bring this water, to draw out the quote unquote water that was poured in to the head waiter of the wedding. This is the guy that planned the whole thing. This is the guy that, you know, uh, uh, I guess back then would judge how the wedding went, you know, oh, it was a su success. It was beautiful. You know, they had food, they had wine. It was, it was a success. It was, it was wonderful. And so, you know, in this verse, Jesus is asking the servants now, not only for their obedience, but for faith and boldness. You know what I'm saying? So they went to this guy, drew the water out and were like, dumb, dumb, dumb. Let's see what happens, you know, because God is asking for our faith and for our boldness in and, and obedience in the commands that he's giving us day by day in our lives. Hallelujah. Glory, Jesus. So in, um, let's see, in verse nine, right? Oh, this little fly is bothering me. Um, verse nine, when the head waiter tasted the water after it became wine. I got to stop right there. There is a beautiful song, a worship song um, from Psalm 34 that Brooklyn Tabernacle sung. You can find it on YouTube if you search up taste and see that that God is good, something like that, um, BT. And I love that song. I just love it. It's a powerful song. You definitely uh, feel the Holy Spirit in that song. And it just basically says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. He'll give you everything. He'll give you everything, right? Um, in Matthew 6, God says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all things will be added unto you, right? So please look up that song because it's beautiful. I was going to sing it, but I don't feel the anointing to. So I'm just going to skip on along through my notes. Um, the Holy Spirit is also a symbol of wine, right? In Luke 22, 20, it says, and in the same way, he took the cup after they had eaten saying, this cup, which is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. Matthew 26, 27 and 28 says, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many forgiveness of sins, right? So not only is the Holy Spirit represented as water, which cleanses and purifies us once we are empty vessels, but it's also, he's also represented as wine, new wine. There's a verse that is not in my notes, but God just brought it right now. It, uh, it says, you know, do not use old wineskins for new wine, because if you pour the new wine into old wineskins, it'll burst and both the, the skin and the wine will be wasted, right? And so what is that saying? We can't live our lives in the old mindset that we had, in the old ways that we were doing things and expect God to come with his Holy Spirit with new things. It's not gonna happen. We have to come to him. It's a process. He gives a promise and then comes the process, just like the Israelites of old. Everything in the Old Testament that was written is for our learning. 
<coughs> excuse me, it's for our learning um, and so that we won't make those same mistakes. Um, so, and we have something that they didn't have. We have the Holy Spirit of the living God, which helps us. Okay. So, um, where was I? It also says he tasted the wine was good, but he did not know where it came from. God gave me John 3, verse 8, where he's talking to Nicodemus and explaining to him the kingdom of God. Nicodemus was one of the Jewish leaders that knew the word of God, but was bound by the law and by religion. He had not yet tasted and seen that God was good and that his grace is really what carries us through life as we seek him. So John 3 verse 8 says, the wind blows wherever it wants, just as you can hear the wind but can't tell where it comes from or where it is going, so you can't explain how people are born in the spirit. So when salvation came upon me and into my own heart, I didn't truly grasp what had happened to me. I just knew um, and was certain of the experience I had. I felt free lifted, not weighed down by life and burdens. And I had an extreme hunger for the word of God like never before. I mean, the new King, the King James language version was like plain English with the these, the thous, the, I would read that. And it was like, God was making it into plain English for me and highlighting how my life had related to the word of God. Um, um, I learned so much. I learned so much scripture. The way I learned so much scripture is was through the Holy Spirit bringing it to life and writing it on the tablet of my heart while I wrote them with pen and paper. So the Holy Spirit, as I read the word of God, the Holy Spirit would highlight a verse. It would jump out at me. It would relate to me and I would write it down on pen and paper. As I'm writing it on pen and paper, the Holy Spirit was writing it on the tablet of my heart. Um, in Psalm 119, it says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you, right? David, I think David wrote that Psalm. One of the Psalmists wrote that Psalm. Um, but that was, that's what was, uh, that's what God was doing. And I believe in the book of Jeremiah, God explains how in the new covenant, he will write his word, his law on the tablet of our hearts by by his holy spirit and that we will no longer know him by hearing of him but we will know him um on our own through our own experience with him um another scripture that goes with this verse is jeremiah 33 3 call unto me and i will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not the servants knew where the wine came from why because they experienced and obeyed jesus's command being around Jesus, hearing his words and command gave them faith and obedience and boldness, right? So uh, hearing come, faith comes by hearing and hearing comes from the word of God, right? So we are constantly being renewed and transformed by the renewing of our minds through the word of God. God then uh, makes the word come alive and that's how he begins to teach us and transform us through his word to the glory of God. Hallelujah. Um, verse 10 says, the old wine is usually saved for last, but in this story, it was reversed, right? And so that, that helps me to think of the upside down kingdom. So when I first got saved, I thought of God's kingdom as the upside down kingdom, but actually the kingdom of this world is upside down according to God. God's kingdom is right side up. But in this world, everything is kind of backwards to his principles and how he wants us to live, right? So he said that the, the person who finishes last in this life will finish first in his kingdom. And the person that's the least in this life will be the greatest in his kingdom, right? So everything is kind of like reversed. And, and in, this, in this verse, verse 10, you know, they saved, quote unquote, saved the uh, best wine for last. Normally in those traditions, in those 
um, parties and weddings that they would have back in the day, they would bring out the good wine first so that whenever people got drunk, then they'll bring out the nasty tasty wine, the older wine, and it wouldn't, they wouldn't taste it really because they were already feeling tipsy, you know? So, um, um, he said, he said it was better than the first, right? And he called it fine wine. So God is showing me here that the first covenant was worse than this one. And not worse, but like that this new covenant we have with Jesus Christ, with God through Jesus Christ, through the blood of Christ is better than the old covenant. It's, it's what God originally intended it to be. Um, relationship with him, uh, purification, holiness, sacredness through his Holy Spirit, right? And so right here I said, transformation at first may be bitter in the stomach, but sweet in the mouth, but it's worth the journey. And if you go to the book of Revelation, when John eats the scroll, the angel tells him it's going to be sweet in your mouth, but it's going to be bitter to your stomach, you know, but it was the word of God. Like it was revelation. It was life-giving. The word of God is life-giving, you know? So I don't want to go much longer because we're already at 30 minutes and I probably lost a lot of people already. But um, long story short, verse 11, he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him, right? Um, That's what it's about. God wants to reveal his glory to those who don't know him, Um, to those who may think that they have heard of him, to those who think that all religions lead to God and lead to heaven. Those are lies from Satan. There is, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by him. And no one is drawn to the Father but by the Father. When I came to salvation and I asked God, you know, if he was real, He's the, I used to pray to only God. I never called God Lord because I didn't know him as Lord. I didn't know Jesus as my savior. I just used to pray to God. And he's the one who brought me to Jesus Christ. He introduced me to his Holy Spirit. His Holy Spirit began to teach me of the things of Jesus. And the whole Bible, Old and New Testament, is about our Lord and Savior. It is about how he is transforming lives. It's about how... He's causing us to desire the things of heaven and not the things of this earth. Um, He said, fix your mind on things above and not the things of the earth for a thief and, 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 and robbers come in to steal. But in heaven, we can't, we can't have our things taken from us in this life. We could live. And, you know, I had this beautiful apartment. He provided for me and my son, my vehicle, God forbid, all those things can be taken from me if it pleases the father. And what am I going to do? Like fight and kick and scream because he took those things away? No, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job uh, is a perfect example of that. You know, when we are going through the wilderness and going through the seasons, 2020 was very difficult for many of us. Many of us. I was in a shelter, a homeless shelter in the beginning of this year. Okay, the Lord drew me into a fast in the beginning of the year. He he drew me into a fast at the end of this year. Why? Because his word commands us to. When 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 the Jewish leaders told Jesus, you know, John's disciples fast, uh the Jewish leaders uh, uh fast, why is it that your disciples don't fast? Jesus told them, "Can um the bride uh rejoice if the bridegroom is I mean, can the bride um, how did he say it? Lord help me. Basically the verse says like, you know, if the bridegroom is still with the bride, like how are they going to like, you know, be sad? Like if, but there will be a time and I'm paraphrasing that verse, there will be a time where the bridegroom is taken from the bride and then they will fast. So this body you know, craves the physical food all the time. That's not real hunger. I was doing a study on fasting while I was on this fast and our body doesn't really hunger, truly hunger for food until after 40 days, sometimes longer, depending on your weight. It's just a a physical craving when the Israelites were in the wilderness You know, they were hungry, so God gave them manna from heaven, which was angel food. And after a while, they got tired of it. They were like, is this all we're going to eat? Like, we had vegetables, we had leeks, we had onions, we had 
everything we had in Egypt and you brought us out here to only give us bread from heaven? Like they were complaining that they didn't have any meat. So God got upset with their complaining and he sent them, uh, I think it was quail, that they would have enough meat that they got sick of it until it came out of their ears and nose, Moses told them. So what does that tell us? That this body has four different appetites, spiritual, hunger, greed, and sex. Four hungers this body has. And if we're constantly feeding those other three physical desires, then that spiritual desire in us is starving. Our spirit man is skinny and um, anemic and malnutritioned. And how are we going to perceive the things of God? When, when, when Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, he said, if you don't understand the things of heaven, I mean, if you don't understand the things I'm telling you, um, the natural things that I'm sharing with you, how are you going to understand the things I tell you of heaven? Because the things of the supernatural are literally out of this world. The natural mind can't comprehend it. And our reasoning is what blocks sometimes God's blessing from us. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So I just pray that this word was encouraging. I know it was kind of strong um, and the deliverance sometimes is strong. We're at 35 minutes. So I pray that whoever stood till the end is blessed. I just want to say a quick prayer as we close out um, to the glory of God. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I pray for everyone that stood, stood till the end of this message. I pray for the words and the seeds that are planted on the soil of their heart right now, Lord, that you would water them, that you would help them to be on good soil, fertile, that their roots would grow strong into the ground, that they would be trees planted on the side of the stream, yielding and producing its fruit in its right season, my God. I pray for anyone that had trouble this year, 2020, Lord, that you would renew their minds, transform their minds by the renewing of their thoughts through your word, that they would surrender and yield to your will, that every day they would speak to you and that they would know that you exist and know that you are a rewarder of those who diligently seek you, my God. I pray that we would lay down our lives this last day of the year 2020, that we would be refreshed tomorrow in the year 2021 by your Holy Spirit, that your plans will be made manifest, that we we will call on your name so that you can reveal things to us that are to come that we have not yet known, oh God. Hallelujah to the glory of God. Father, you're not going to lay out the whole plan for 2021, but you are going to give us exactly what we need and what we need to know so that we prosper as we prosper in our spirit. Father, bless these ones, Lord, as they um, go about their days. Father, I pray for blessing. I pray for refreshing in the name of Jesus and that you will continue to build us up, Lord, in your ways, in your principles and statues and in your truth, Father. We love you. We praise you. We worship you and we give you all the glory and all the honor and all the praise in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, all of you beautiful people created in the image of God. Again, welcome, and thank you for tuning in to Amazing Creations. I'm Christina Cerezo, just a humble servant of God, to the glory of God. I started this channel because he wanted me to, and I will continue to post as he leads. God bless you all. Take care. Happy New Year.